What's up ladies and gents and welcome back to another civilization overview. We have done the Assyrians last time and today we are going to focus on the Babylonians. The Babylonians are an interesting sieve, I will tell that much up front, but obviously we are once again going to start at the left with the civilization bonuses. We see here we have four bonuses, which is in line with most of the other sieves, which have three to four bonuses. We had the outlier Assyrians last time, this time a little more of a normal number. We see as the first bonus that stone miners work 20% faster and carry plus two stone. We will see at the end of the video with the practical tests how much of an effect that really has. But in my opinion, stone is the least important of the four resources so that's already a judgment from my side which says it's a bit of a questionable bonus in the large scale it does however suit with the theme of the babylonians as we can see a bit further down with walls and towers having plus 60 percent hit points which already sets the tone for a sieve that can get the stone required for the walls and towers faster. In between we see that market technologies cost minus 30%. That sounds pretty good, and it is pretty good, but how much that really saves you we are going to see in a bit in the practical tests as well. Priests rejuvenate 30% faster is the last bonus, and let's be honest there, it's not a bad bonus, but it's not going to be something that you are going to notice too much in your regular gameplay, unless you incorporate priests very actively. With the bonuses being covered, let's look at the first military building. The barracks. As you can see they have a completely full barracks which goes from clubman to legion and which also incorporates the slinger which is one of the main differences to the Assyrians that we see already. We have a slinger. That means that in the early ages we have everything available in the barracks and if we so choose we can go down until the legion unit. For the variety that is obviously good, having more available is always a good thing. Now how good is their infantry really you might ask, because having units available is one thing, how good they are is quite another. So let's check that out by looking at the storage pit and we can see that's not great because we have the full offensive upgrades but we lack chainmail infantry, we lack iron shield, we lack tower shield. So while our infantry certainly packs a punch, they are not very durable, as we can see here, once we get into the Iron Age. Now until then, until the Bronze Age, they are fully upgraded, as you can see, we can go to Broadswordsmen with all the upgrades. So they are usable until that stage, and that is good. Now obviously, like I think every sieve, we have logistics and that is useful if you are going for infantry units and that is already everything that really matters for infantry. So the verdict on the barracks is it's pretty good, not a strong suit. So I would probably give it a usable grade. Next up we have the archery range and as you can already see we have once again everything into the bronze age including improved bowmen and composite bowmen which are quite strong as well as chariot archers which are an important trash unit if the game goes late and without gold or if you're trying to save gold. And we have horse archers, but no heavy horse archers and no elephant archers, 
which means the truly heavy hitters are missing here. What about the upgrades, you might ask? And here we see a similar thing, namely we are missing the chainmail archer armor. And that is a theme throughout, as you can already see, they are missing all the, the Iron Age defense upgrades. But luckily for the archer units, we have all the range upgrades here in the woodcutting area. And they also get ballistics and alchemy, which is incredibly good for the archers as alchemy gives them increased damage and ballistics lets them hit moving targets. So these two very important Iron Age upgrades, which really makes this one upgrade missing a bit neglectable, in my opinion. Especially since you can get really strong composite bowmen that only lack this one upgrade. The horse archers, on the other hand, they are pretty good. They obviously get nobility here as well, which is very good. They get the ballistics and the alchemy upgrade. So the horse archers are also among the better ones despite lacking that one defense upgrade, but obviously you can't upgrade them to heavy horse archers. So once again, usable, pretty good, pretty strong, not something that you can truly beat dedicated sifs at. Now we move on to the siege workshop. And in my opinion, despite lacking the Helepolis and Ballista, it's actually one of the stronger suits for the Babylonians because we get heavy catapults. Heavy catapults in this game are very strong. And on top of that, the Babylonians get the range, they get ballistics, they get alchemy, and they get engineering, which gives plus two siege weapon range. So those are fully upgraded heavy catapults. And boy, do they pack a punch. So do not underestimate the Babylonian siege just because they lack the ballista and helepolis. In my opinion, one of the strong points, certainly. Then next up on the list, we can see the stable and we can already see no heavy cavalry, no cataphract, no elephants. Usable into the Bronze Age, which really encapsulates the entire Babylonian sieve. Everything in the Bronze Age is fully upgraded. As you can see here, it's just, it just works. Once again, we have nobility, as we already discussed with the horse archers. We get all the upgrades into the Bronze Age. We get the, the upgrade for attack. So really the only thing missing is once again the last defense upgrade. And in my opinion, that is okay if you go for the Scythe Chariots late in the game. You're missing one defense upgrade, which is okay. But obviously when you go late game, cavalry not very strong suit as you are missing heavy cavalry, cataphract, war elephant and armored elephant. So really the Scythe Chariot is the unit of choice. If you go late, you go into a trash war, you need a strong unit that doesn't cost gold. The Scythe Chariot more than, is more than capable of filling that role. You might be wondering why I'm saying that, but call the infantry not ideal, but usable. It's because the infantry is missing this and those two upgrades, except of only this one. And for infantry, ranged defense is important because they often get cut down before they reach their target. That doesn't happen with horses as often. And in addition, the Babylonian sieve has the scythe chariot and that is the strong suit for them if you go cavalry late in the game because it doesn't cost any gold. And the legions obviously cost gold. Now they don't cost much, but they still do. So I would call the cavalry not very diversified. It's not a strong suit, but 
thanks to the Scythe Chariot and the upgrades it gets, it's passable. So next up, just like with the Assyrians, we see an academy that really doesn't stand out. While you get pretty good hoplites in the Bronze Age if you truly need them, that's really all you get. Unlike the Assyrians, you do get aristocracy, which makes your hoplites move a little bit faster in the Iron Age. But since you don't even get phalanx nor the defense upgrades, using them past the Bronze Age is probably not the greatest idea. So that is certainly a weakness. Now we have already looked over the storage pit, so we will now go to the granary, which really along with our bonuses here of walls and towers having faster or more hit points and stone miners working faster, it just explains the whole theme of the sieve because you can see we have all the towers, we have all the walls. So defensive buildings are amazing for the Babylonians. And not only that, you can obviously also use towers to push an enemy. So that is truly one of the best, if not the best sieve for towers and walling up and just having durable towers is so advantageous, especially, especially since you have architecture, which gives you less build time and more building and wall hit points. You have ballistics for the towers and you have alchemy for the towers. So in my opinion, those might be the best towers in the game and certainly the most durable defensive buildings in the game. So if you can try to make use of that because that is your strong point as the Babylonians. So next up we have the market and we will cover the minus 30% bonus at the end where we do the practical testing. But you can already see the market has everything available. So that is pretty good for your economy. And it also enhances the bonus because if you think about it, the more techs you have available, the more often the minus 30% saving comes into play. So that really goes hand in hand with one another and obviously helps your economy greatly. The market here also gets a plus and is a strong suit. Then we have a government center and as you can also see here we have everything available to us and we already looked over that when looking at the different units but just to sum it up having nobility for the horse units great having architecture alchemy and ballistics obviously works well with your defensive building bonus and your strong siege with engineering, alchemy and ballistics also just goes hand in hand. So certainly very nice to have all of these upgrades available. Next up and second to last, we have the temple. And as you can already see, it is an amazing temple because we have all of the techs available to us and we have 30% faster rejuvenating priests. Now I said in the beginning that the faster rejuvenating priests are a bit situational. It's not a great bonus, but it's a pretty good bonus if you do go for priests. And as you can see here, having all the upgrades for them, going for priests is not a bad idea. Especially because you have the Scythe Chariot with nobility and almost full upgrades. And the Chariot Archer with, once again, nobility and almost full upgrades, except of the Chainmail Archer armor, but you have these two. So you pretty much have a full trash line. You have the Axeman, you have the Chariot Archer, you have the Scythe Chariot, you have the Scouts, you have all the units that don't cost gold. And you have the defensive buildings to support them. So your need for gold units is mostly the Siege Weapons, which are very strong. And then you can use a lot of that gold that you might have on the priests. 
So priests certainly a very strong suit for the Babylonians and something that I can only recommend going for to also make use of the faster rejuvenating priests. And lastly we have the dark. As you can already see it's not a great one. Babylonians not a powerhouse on the water. We do not have catapult triremes or juggernauts. We do not have triremes and let's be honest that's not great. Now war galleys can hold their own into the Bronze Age but once you go into the Iron Age and your opponent just upgrades his war galley army into triremes you're going to fall behind because you then have to start producing fire galleys which are not bad but you really if the enemy has a large army of triremes you have trouble getting close and you have trouble building up those units because you can only start producing them once you are in the Iron Age, whereas the other player already has his pre-produced war galleys and can just upgrade to triremes. So really getting the transition right from war galleys to the fire galleys and not losing your war galley army to a superior trireme army while you are waiting to build up your fire galleys is the challenge on the water for the Babylonians. Having the fire galley however is nice especially since you also have alchemy and that also gives you increased damage for the fire galleys which is good. Apart from that not the greatest units because you also can't really fire on the land too far so all in all not a great water and especially tricky to play when you go from the Bronze Age into the Iron Age and have to make that switch against a trireme civilization. So be careful there and take note. And now let's jump into the practical testing. And here we are back with the market. Now as you can see from the start we have mentioned that the market technologies cost 30% less. But what does it mean in practice? How much of an advantage is that actually? How much of a saving does that actually turn out to be? And I did the adding up and the actual base technologies cost you 2015 food, 825 wood, 150 stone and 100 gold. Now right off bat we can see that the effect on stone and gold is basically non-existent but obviously I still did the math, I compared the prices and as it turns out the 30% are applied correctly. I would be quite surprised if that wasn't the case but as expected instead of 150 stone the Babylonian text cost 105 stone which is 70% of the 150 value, which means a saving of 45 stone, which is the 30%. In the gold department, same thing. We had the 100 gold cost, which is here. This is now 70. So 70% 70 of the base, 30% saving, 30 gold saved. Now you might be saying, well, 45 stone, 30 gold, that's, well, pretty much nothing. So. How good is that bonus? Well, the bonus really comes into play in the first two values with the 2015 food being reduced to 1411. Now, that is the expected value, so the math was applied correctly there as well. And that is a saving of 604 food. Now, if you think about it, over the course of the game saving 600 food gets you a lot of extra either other technologies i mean this could get you this one and this one and this one that's the cost of the entire attack upgrades the food cost covered already in savings that you have in the market so that is actually quite the substantial difference if you think about it if you get all the upgrades that is obviously and in the wood department we see something well, not quite as substantial because the 825 base is a lot lower, but 
it turns out we have 579 wood cost in the Babylonian market tax. That is a saving of 246 wood, which is slightly below the 30%, but that's just due to rounding differences. So it's pretty much still exactly what we would have expected. So those are the savings that the Babylonian market has. To sum it up, we can pretty much say the food saving really makes a difference. In every other regard, it's not very substantial. The wood saving is nice, but not that great. And the stone and gold is fairly neglectable. And we will see each other with the watchtower and wall HP upgrades. So here we see the tower line and the wall line. And as we can see on the left, the walls and towers have 60% extra hit points. Now, what does that mean in practice? Now, I compared the base numbers and where the math as expected was applied correctly. So we have 240 hit points for the base ballista tower and 384 for the Babylonian one. We can see that here, 384 hit points. Now that is exactly 60% more, so everything correct here. And then we have 400 HP for the fortified wall and 640 for the Babylonian one. That much is as expected. Architecture, on the other hand, gives 20% bonus to that. So for a regular ballista tower, you get 288 hit points bonus. And for the fortified wall, you get 480. Those are pretty fine values, but for the Babylonians, obviously, those are much higher at 460 hit points for the Ballista Tower and 768 for the Fortified Wall. What you will notice when you do the math is that the values the Babylonians get mean that architecture is actually applied on the base of the Babylonian value. So it's applied to this number, 384 plus the 20%. So not only do you get a 60% bonus on the base value, but another 20% on that new value. So the base value is completely replaced also in the sense of architecture, which is a great bonus for the Babylonians. It makes architecture even more potent than it already is or would be. But you're probably wondering what the hell does that mean in practice? Is that actually as useful as it sounds? And when you think about it, a regular fortified wall piece takes 12 shots to destroy from a heavy catapult. Now, 12 shots, it does take a while, but it's, you know, it's not that long if you think about it. When you have two heavy catapults, it obviously goes down to six shots each. So yeah, it goes down in a reasonable amount of time. But a Babylonian one with architecture, both numbers are with architecture, a Babylonian one with architecture takes 20 shots. And that is actually quite impressive. Because if you think about 20 shots to take down a fortified wall piece just so that you can breach through the wall is incredible. So walling up gets a lot more potent. And the same is true if you think about the Ballista Tower. And a Ballista Tower takes 13 shots from a heavy catapult before it goes down. Whereas when you have the Babylonian Ballista Towers, it takes 21 shots. 21 shots is a lot to take down one tower. You know, if you have a couple of towers, it takes so many shots and it buys you so much more time in your defense that this really shows the strength of the Babylonians in just buying time to defend yourself. So certainly a very, very strong suit. And I think those numbers pretty much clearly explain that. Now, both of those values are roughly 160% of the base value. So exactly those 60% extra. So once again, exactly what we would have expected. But I think when you hear it in heavy catapult charts, it's just turning into a whole different discussion because you are starting to have a practical feel for it. And lastly, we will look at where the Babylonians are in the campaign. 
and we will do that in just a moment. So here we are with the campaigns and I was actually quite surprised about the Babylonian appearances because I expected more. Now obviously, let's get it straight out of the way. We have the Babylonian campaign, so if you want Babylon to be covered in the campaign, well, play the Babylon campaign. Um, you play against the Babylonian Civ, you play obviously with the Babylonian Civ. So everything you could ask for right here campaign for you now with that out of the way we obviously already have a lot of coverage for the babylonians where else are we and surprisingly to me they are not in the egypt campaign at all and i expected them to at least shop once i didn't remember everything about the Egypt campaign but still I thought they would probably appear but nope no appearance they do appear in the Greek campaign in the last mission so you can see here the Alexander the Great mission which hint hint you can find on my channel hint hint like all the campaigns anyway you can find it in the last mission and they appear as one of the enemies as the satrapy of Ibernari so yeah, there you have a Babylonian appearance when obviously the Babylon campaign is full of Babylon. Just what you would expect. Yamato, obviously no kind of ties or any sort of connection to the Babylonians, so they do not appear there. Although that doesn't mean anything. I mean, we had it in the previous video about the Assyrians showing up on some of the campaigns where you probably wouldn't have expected them. But no such thing here with the Babylonians. Reign of the Hittites. We can just jump in here real quick. Raid on Babylon. Obviously, we have two Babylonian opponents. And, well, it would be surprising if the Raid on Babylon had no Babylonian players or enemies or whatever you want to call it. And that's it. That's all we can see of the Babylonians. They do not appear in any of the Rome campaigns. They were not used as kind of a token filler like the Assyrians were. So, yeah, that's already everything we have to say about the, the Babylonians. Now, obviously, this campaign, if you are interested in the Babylonians, is always where to play. It's also a pretty good campaign. I can recommend playing it. But, yeah, that's... We're Babylonians in the campaign if you were interested. So I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching. And until next time with the next Civ, farewell.